We have been taught to think of Egypt as a civilization whose golden age occurred two or three thousand years before Christ. Imagining this magnificent culture springing from small settlements in biblical times makes us wonder whether we've got the timeline right. World cultures have myths that speak of high levels of consciousness, superior science, art and architecture from eons ago. How do we reconcile this? We are trapped in our own concept of time, but many cultures think on a vastly different scale. Science has established that the earliest human remains are about 2.5 million years old. It has shifted our marker back, so that now we are able to conceive of human culture being much, much older. In Indian traditions, and in 30 other cultures, a 26,000 year cycle is accepted. How does that affect the traditional chronology of Egypt, which insists that the pyramids were constructed as recently as 2450 BC? Will this force the issue of rethinking the chronology of ancient Egypt? Every year, authors, scientists, and alternative thinkers come together for the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge. They share ideas about ancient cultures, lost knowledge, and great cycles of time. I started the Conference on Procession and Ancient Knowledge because I wanted to bring together the bright minds in this whole field of alternative history so we can put this very ancient puzzle back together again. Geologists, physicists, engineers, and archaeoastronomers discuss the accepted dating of world history. I'm convinced that there is a, mis a mis misunderstanding about the tenets of Egyptian civilization. And I'm convinced that there is a mis misunderstanding about its datings. To me as a geologist, it's unquestionable that the chronology has to be redone. Knowledge of procession and advanced astronomy existed in extremely distant times. So I think we're looking at a chronology that's far, far older than is accepted. By integrating recent scientific discoveries in different disciplines, they define a new timeline of our past. The Egyptians provided us with concrete evidence that describes political events from a far more distant past than we can imagine. Why has this been overlooked? The Egyptians themselves, in at least one stone tablet, the Palermo Stone, and one papyrus, the, the Turin papyrus, they say that, that ancient Egypt is much, much older than the Egyptologists think it is. So to dismiss that is, of course, an assumption that contemporary Egyptologists know a lot more about ancient Egyptian history than ancient Egyptians do, which is a form of typical arrogance on the part of the academic community. So why do we consider civilization to be only about 6,000 years old? Is it because of our limited imagination, or is there another reason? Modern scholars tend to minimize the age because it fits better with the current paradigm of history. You know, the current paradigm is, is 5,000 years ago man was hunter-gatherer. He had to have writing before he could build large structures or civilizations. Uh, he came together uh, to protect himself from other warring parties. 
things like this. And so, for example, in Corral, Peru, when they found that amazing uh, six pyramid structure down there, they assumed it was built by the Incas, because that's only 500 years ago, and Incas built most of South America. Well, when they got this very good carbon dating that shows it's 4,700 years old, it really blows a hole in, uh, in current history theory. Generally, the academic community is, is just sort of silent about it right now because they don't have any good ideas with the current theories of history. A cross-disciplinary approach helps us to put hard evidence and theory together to reach a greater understanding. If we consider the data coming from astronomy, geology, astrology, and climatology, we can arrive at new conclusions about the chronology of ancient Egypt. We have two sciences that are playing with it. We have astronomy, we have geology. With the pyramids, we have a much more precise science. They have aligned the monuments. And they have the religious ideas locked to the, um, to the machinery of the sky and the constellations and the sun and so forth. So we can use that with high precision and arrive at a date. How does this information affect the dating of the Great Pyramid? Was it really built when Egyptologists say it was? Well, the traditional date for the Great Pyramid is about 2550 or so BC, you know, give or take. I mean, people argue about the dates, um, and some people want to date it down to a particular year. I think that's for a precision that's not justified whatsoever. I like to use the metaphor of painting a house. If you painted your house last in 2003, that doesn't mean your house was built in 2003. So I subscribe to the notion that there was probably quite a lot of work done on the Great Pyramid in 2450 BC, but that it probably was built quite a bit earlier than that. There's something very threatening about changing the dates because it takes us out of the patriarchal era. But I think that there was a whole world of Egypt that existed in matriarchal times. And I think the evidence is quite strong for that. There is absolutely no reason at all why the ancient Egyptians could not have worked out the precession cycle. How do we approach the age? Well, you have a variety of methods when you're looking at an archaeological site. You have what we call the archaeological datings, which means you look at uh, artifacts that you can fit into a chronology. You look at pot charts, uh, stratas, but this can be very deceiving uh, because it requires a lot of interpretation. Uh, nonetheless, these are the methods that, that is predominantly used in archaeology. The other is carbon dating. The carbon dating is okay and up to a point and it's notoriously misleading if it's been contaminated and so forth. And besides, uh, with many of these places, we do not have carbon datable material. Carbon-14 dating works only on organic materials, but simply touching organic materials contaminates a sample. Stone cannot be carbon dated. There is another form of dating, which is to use precessional uh, astronomy. What can we use to measure time? Are there markers that connect to the movement of the stars? The stars would shift about one degree every 72 years. It's not anymore in the same spot. Our planet is moving, but we can't feel it. Uh, not in the same position. And that was, it's, it's in a change all the time. Nothing stands still. You know that uh, our planet makes a cycle every 24 hours, sunrise every 24 hours, right? But our planet also ru uh, revolve in a, a different way. Precession is the motion of the axis of the Earth, which wobbles like a spinning top due to gravitational pull. They make one round every 26,000 years. If you have a monument. Uh, for example, let's take um, one that we know for sure. The temple of uh, Isis at Dendra. It's a small temple behind the, the Hadha temple. Uh, that one is 
99% sure aligned to the rising of Sirius. So if we have certainty that the temple has its axis aligned to the rising of a star, and we know which star it is, then we can date it. It's very simple, we do it in a matter of minutes. This is known as precessional astronomy. The star moves or appears to move because of the precessional wobble. We have a date. Plato called a precessional cycle of 26,000 years a great year. The great year is uh, Plato's term for this, this vast cycle of time, one eon, one precession of the equinox. It's about 24,000 years. And there's over 200 myths that talk about this cycle of alternating dark and golden ages, or that make reference to a, a golden age in the distant past. 30 different cultures uh, have passed down these myths from time to time, and they all related to the movement of the stars, which we know today as precession. Even Sir Isaac Newton himself wrote a book on it, trying to match history to each of the uh, constellations of the zodiac. And uh, it was wiped out by the Darwinian evolution uh, paradigm, which came along, you know, less than 200 years ago, where it became inacceptable to admit that a, a culture that lived long, long before us might know something that we don't know. On different continents, cultures have come up with the same ideas. There's a certain uh, uh, science of cycles that's embedded into the world age doctrine of the Maya. You find it nicely paralleled in Egyptian ideas as well as the uh, Hindu world age doctrine known as the Yugas. And it's, and it's somewhat counterintuitive to what we've learned in our own Western education that it, it's referred to as the myth of progress, that human beings today are in all ways superior to human beings that came before. Um, it's simply not true. Uh, cycles go through periods of increase and periods of decrease. Mayan day keepers are descendants of the ancient Mayan people and monitor the sacred calendar. Each day has certain qualities and gods. Day keepers follow the movement of planets, eclipses, and astrological alignments. They are often trained shamans who do divination ceremonies, giving daily and monthly forecasts. The Maya calendar is really interesting because it's based on a lunar rhythm. And uh, the core building block of the sacred calendar is this 260-day cycle. Maya daykeepers today will offer as an explanation for this that it corresponds to the human gestation period. It's roughly nine months. So all human beings share this, this primal rhythm of unfolding based upon the lunar cycle. And that's a real interesting key to the, what you might say, the Mayan time philosophy. There are many ways of dividing time. Solar cycles, lunar cycles, and larger cycles of time. The Mayans devised their long count calendar, which combines a cycle of 20 named days with another cycle of 13 numbers to produce 260 unique days. Each of the 20 days is linked to a different god in Mayan mythology. The Great Cycle started in 3114 BC and ends in December 2012. Well, the Long Count Calendar is the most inter interesting calendar that the Maya had devised. This is of great interest in our times because this, this large cycle in the Long Count Calendar, this period of 13 Baktuns, ends in 2012. So there's a, a great interest in figuring out why the early Maya sky watchers picked 2012 to end this large cycle of time. The Mayans were excellent calendar makers. They intercorrelated uh, the movements of, of the moon, uh, the sun, and even Venus to make their calendars very precise. And for some reason, they have their long count calendar, the Baktun, ending here in 2012. So it seems perhaps they're trying to call attention to something. Many people have been talking about 2012 as a turning point. What is the significance of this date? 
In the years around 2012, the December solstice sun will be lining up with the center of our Milky Way galaxy. This is a rare alignment in the great cycle of the precession of the equinoxes, this 26,000 year cycle. Now, another thing that's interesting about this period of the uh, 13 Bakhtun cycle that began in 3113 BC and ends in 2012 is its midpoint, 550 BC. This is a time when great world teachers appeared on the stage of history. Pythagoras among the Greeks, the Buddha, Zoroaster uh, among the uh, ancient early Persians. So there's also something to be said for the way that the long count divides up time in a certain way that defines uh, periods in, in human culture, you know, dawn points, high noon points, and end points. carved stone, or stela, describing the long count calendar, was discovered at Ixapa in Mexico. It shows the center of the Milky Way, the celestial pole, and the sun deity. Why was this important to the Mayans? It's, it's really a, a beautiful and profound way of conceiving time. And in my research, as I've looked at Izapa, the origin place of the 2012 calendar, I've been able to see how the Mayan wisdom, it's not just some provincial belief system of a, of a forgotten people. It actually is like a little doorway that opens up into the great spiritual insights that all of the great traditions share. In Egypt, in India, uh, Islam, all the world's great spiritual traditions share these same universal eternal spiritual principles and it has to do with cycle endings. Just like the cycles of birth, life and death, within the 26,000 year cycle referred to as the great year, there are extended periods of darkness and light. These are divided into distinct ages known as the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. The ancients themselves told us that history, mankind, would go into a dark age. 4,000, 5,000 years ago, they view the past as the Golden Age. They see themselves moving into the Dark Age, and they dread it because they know that things are going to get worse, they're going to get chaotic. Uh, cultures all around the world are talking about this pre-dark age, that, that things are going downhill. I really ascribe to the Mayan and the Hindu idea that the golden age, the time of, of connection into the divine wisdom, was actually a long time ago. And we've been moving through periods of increasing densification, uh, increasing alienation from the spiritual light. Golden Ages are times of enlightenment, when civilizations reach high points in architecture, spirituality, and benevolence. This is considered to decline slightly in the Silver Age, further deteriorating in the Bronze Age, and reaching extreme levels of chaos, corruption, and ignorance in the Iron Age or Dark Age. Then, the cycle works its way back up to the next Golden Age. One of the ways to measure the 26,000-year Yuga cycles is through the ages of the Zodiac, which the ancient Egyptians clearly understood. The origin of the zodiacal signs is, is, is a very good question, actually, and, and probably impossible to determine. The only one of the signs that vaguely looks like what it's supposed to is Leo the lion. Um, the stars making up Virgo definitely don't look like a virgin, whatever a virgin looks like these days. And the other signs are equally mysterious, the crab, the, the bull, etc., etc. Knowledge of precession and advanced astronomy existed in extremely distant times. The basis of the signs themselves in terms of zodiac, the, the, the wheel of life or the wheel of animals, there are different translations of that. 
mean, if you really want to know what the signs signify, you have to go into the qualities and properties of the signs themselves. In other words, each sign is male or female. Each sign is fire, earth, air, water. Each of the 12 signs of the zodiac has distinct energies. There are four elements, earth or material signs, air or intellectual signs, water or emotional signs, and fire or creative signs. By looking at the 12 zodiacal ages of about 2,000 years each, we can rethink the Egyptians' concepts of time and recreate the chronology. There is a gap in our historical record. The Palermo Stone and the Turin Papyrus are evidence from the Egyptians themselves and convey information from rulers far back in Egyptian history. And they give the regnal years and the name of each of these rulers. And when you compute all of those names and put the numbers together, you get a date somewhere around 34, 36,000 BC. At the same time, roughly, uh, that 36, 34,000 year date corresponds to the Vedas of India, the Vedic, Vedic civilization of India, which also gives a date which, when you work it out, comes out to something like 40,000 years before our current era. So we have two great sophisticated civilizations that have documented their own belief that their civilization started back around that kind of time. It is interesting to note that this is roughly one and a half processional cycles ago, dating back to a previous golden age. The Sphinx, with its lion body, screams out as a Leo symbol, as a marker for an age of Leo. The last age of Leo had its ingress at around 10,500 BC. So that's the date favored by, by Graham and by Robert Boval. I'm hesitant to accept that date myself because the, the last ice age comes to a catastrophic end somewhere around 11,000, 11,500 BC. I mean, it certainly followed, and this is known, there are the quaternary extinctions, all the mammoths and the woolly rhinoceroses die all over the world. Siberia, which was temperate, becomes, becomes tundra and, and arctic. North America, which was under a couple of miles of ice sheet, melts and all that water goes into the sea. The sea rises 300 feet over the course of a couple of thousand years, but in stages, and some of those stages very precipitous, maybe corresponding to the biblical flood and possibly Plato's Atlantis myth. So under these circumstances, which are catastrophic the world over, I, to me, it seems unlikely that the Sphinx and the pyramids, which presuppose a settled and stable and sophisticated society, could have built those amazing structures under those kinds of conditions. So that leaves anything before 10,500 BC, but I like the idea of the Leo symbolism. So the next age of Leo back is 26,000 years earlier, and that puts it back at around 36,000 BC, which outrageous as it sounds, by a, a process of exclusion, turns out to be maybe less outrageous because there are big problems with those other later dates. Looking at the weathering on the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure, that weathering was clearly formed by runoff from precipitation. It is indeed water weathering and precipitation induced, so it has to have been done in the distant past, and the question then is, how distant was that past? It could take tens of thousands of years for the Nile to have migrated eight miles. Can we use this evidence to redate these monuments? When you look at geology, you can see that the riverbed has migrated all the way from the west, beyond 50 kilometers to the west, 
Then it passed across the plateau, and you can see that the ri ancient riverbed actually went right up to the pyramids, and the initiates could have stepped right off these barges up onto the causeways into the pyramids. Now, if you look, the Nile is a full eight miles to the east, and it's the dividing point between Cairo and Giza. And so if we look at geological time, it would take several tens of thousands of years in order for the Nile to make that migration. We can compare that to places like Tiwanaku in Bolivia that almost certainly was on the edge of Lake Titicaca and now it's 50 miles away. So it changes the whole idea of how ancient these places could have been. How many thousands of years does it take for a river to make this huge journey? The oases of El Kaga and Fayum run parallel to the Nile today, but a hundred kilometers west. It seems that the river migrated all the way from here to its current course. Evidence of ancient human settlements has been found in the area that is now desert, but once had water. At these locations are stone circles, indicating a knowledge of astronomy. What does it tell us about the distant past? What can we conclude about the dating of the pyramids and the Sphinx? And all I can really say at this point, given the data I have, is that I think it has to be at least back to 5000 BC. Could it be older? In fact, may, might it well be older? Yes. Generally, if sort of pressed for dates, I'll say my best estimate is somewhere in the period of 7,000 to 5,000 BC. Um, so that, that's really a working range that I'm comfortable with. We're also finding elsewhere in Egypt and around the world that other things were happening in that same period, 7,000 to 5,000 approximately BC, that to me puts the Sphinx into a larger regional and global setting, that it's not just an isolated thing. It doesn't seem as isolated as it did 15 years ago when we had less knowledge. You come to tentative conclusions, if more data comes in that seems to indicate something else, I don't ever want to be afraid to um, change my conclusions or you know, go where the evidence takes me. I'll stick with my extreme 36,000 BC date until proved otherwise, and if proved otherwise, I will change my mind. How can we tie the concept of the Yuga, or Vedic cycles, into something more concrete that we can recognize in our own history? If we re-examine the stories that are often dismissed as fanciful myth, we might find that it indicates greater forces in play. Those of us that are seriously looking at this old Vedic concept of the world ages, the cycle, we know that the Golden Age, the last Golden Age, basically the, the peak of the cycle was about 11,500 BC, the highest point. We also know that Plato mentions uh, a series of catastrophes which have come down to us as the Atlantis legend, in which he claims that on our calendar system it would have been around 9500 BC. Some tremendous upheaval apparently occurred, a lot of destruction. Isn't it also possible that for all of those maybe several thousand years, whatever those catastrophes were, were so cataclysmic that even with that Silver Age or Golden Age consciousness, they weren't fully able to recover? The end of the, of the Golden Age and the decline into the falling Silver Age, or what we would refer to as Mental Age, marked the time at which we were falling out of a state on this planet where the average person had the potential or capability to be in a state, a very high state of awareness. And they were a far more enlightened and benevolent society than we would be able to even imagine now, but they were beginning to lose that almost divine state that exists in the Golden Age. And as they started to descend into the, the Silver Age, 
there began to be more of an emphasis on what we would now refer to as sacred sites and sacred structures. You could almost think of them as machines to enhance consciousness or to create an environment um, where, you know, you might call it altered states of experience, but changes in consciousness, expansion of consciousness. What these were really intended to do, it wasn't so much for the selfish purpose of, for example, boosting up a few individuals. This actually had to do with a much larger global perspective. And that's effectively what the Great Pyramid was. It was basically a, a device, a generator for, if you will, broadcasting and transmitting throughout the planetary structure, a type of field which uplifted the entire humanity. For at least a thousand years, this structure performed beautifully. My guess is that it probably did a lot to help offset the fall into the Dark Ages. And I think what the pyramids did is that for those individuals that were at least somewhat receptive, it is it kind of kept that energy polarized into the higher centers. This is very real, and I think this is very important. It's like uh, great art or great um, spiritual insight, expansion of consciousness. In a way, there's nothing more important than that. It couldn't do it forever because eventually Mother Nature is going to win out and this cycle is part of nature. It's as much a part of the natural world as uh, day and night are. We have the ability to grasp those electromagnetic forces and the more fundamental forces that underlie those to basically prop up humanity for a while using the system. Now the pyramids only have a very direct effect if you're close to them, which is the way it is in this age. You know, if we go stand in the pyramid, we might feel an effect like that. But I suspect thousands of years ago, you didn't have to be near it. I think it was probably a global effect. The physical structure could only do so much. The wisdom keepers created social structures as an additional influence to extend the energy of the Golden Age by creating mystery schools that preserved the ancient knowledge. The whole idea of the schools of mystery and the ancient knowledge and preserving those traditions that had come down from those fabulous ages, that was lost. And then eventually it was ridiculed and then finally it had to go underground because people would, would either actively burn those texts or you know, persecute the people who, who had that belief system. And I think at that point, we were in the Dark Ages. The exact end of the cycle of darkness is approaching. Each winter solstice before 2012, our sun comes into close alignment with the galactic center. This means we are beginning to feel the shift of energy already, even though the exact conjunction is December the 21st, 2012. So all signs point to the interpretation that we are deep into the period of increasing darkness. What happens at the end of that downward trend uh, is a turnabout. And I believe that that's where we are right now in history. The Mayan material for 2012 basically indicates this turnabout point, this point of, of maximized spiritual darkness. But then in the cycles of time, we turn the corner and we have an opportunity to open up to the transformational energies that can sweep us into the next cycle. I hope that the Mayan ancestors trying to interpret uh, the few writings that are left are correct, that it, that it means there's going to be some quickening or something like that. Because that would actually go with our latest understanding of the yugas. What a yuga cycle really is, is one procession of the equinox. And uh, you know, using these later scholars' interpretation, we're actually in the very early stages of uh, consciousness accelerating. 
that has to do with the opportunity that we have to open up to the divine wisdom, to the transformational energies. But it always comes down to free will. Nothing is predetermined. It always comes down to a choice that we all have to close down in fear, succumb to fear, close down, become more limited in our consciousness, or open up, open up to the blessing of the connection to the higher wisdom that is symbolized in the Maya tradition by the galactic center, the womb of the Great Mother, that which can transform and renew. Could the ancients have had it right? Perhaps we should consider that we too can return to high levels of consciousness, heightened perception, and inspired creativity. It would serve us well to embrace nature and to protect the planet's environment. Can we go beyond religious dogma and allow ourselves to imagine what lies beyond death? How would humanity change if, instead of material wealth, consciousness was our highest value? The ideas depicted in the Pyramid Code revolutionize accepted beliefs about the purpose and the age of the pyramids and the Sphinx. Clearly not tombs, these ancient structures may have been used to access and transmit a type of energy that affects human consciousness. We have seen concrete evidence of high-level technology with laser-cut crystals polished black basalt floors, and curious and sophisticated instruments, including those that generated energy from sound and light. Looking at the old riverbed, it seems clear that the Nile has migrated over time and that it once flowed to the east of the pyramids. The ancient Egyptians built temples using sacred geometry corresponding to cavities in the human body. They had a profound belief in the significance of the stars and how the patterns of the constellations corresponded to our place in the cosmos. They understood large cycles of time and they kept meticulous records of the motion of the stars and planets. The ancients had a deep respect for the sacred feminine principle and the importance of balancing the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. From pre-dynastic to dynastic times, the ancients maintained a deep reverence for nature. They were astonishingly creative and artistic. From clues left on temple walls, it seems clear that our Egyptian ancestors accessed altered states of consciousness. Their primary concerns were how we arrived in our earthly bodies, described in terms of biology, and what happened when we left our earthly bodies, described in terms of cosmology. Our ancestors left clues embedded in symbols that had multiple layers of meaning. They were empowered humans using the full capacity of their senses. 
Today, our planet is in trouble politically, economically, environmentally, and morally. Many will agree that corrupt people hold places of power. Citizens are taxed beyond reason, and riches are amassed by an elite that controls the world. With all this evidence of the sophisticated science left by the ancients, can we still uphold the belief that we are the most advanced society that has ever existed on planet Earth? Is today's test-driven education system effective? Instead of rote memorization of facts, what would happen if today's youth were taught to expand their capacity to know? If we were taught to seek truth and justice, living by the ancient law of Mart, how would our society change? Taking our cue from the ancients, if we live in tune with nature, in an atmosphere of creativity and peace, and if we connect to spirituality, is this the answer to a healthy future for humanity? The ominous date of December the 21st, 2012, is fast approaching. Does this herald doomsday, or could it be a powerful gateway into new ways of being and thinking? Are we turning the corner and ascending out of the Age of Darkness to journey toward a new golden age? Is it possible that the ancients living in a golden age in the distant past were able to see into future cycles of time? Could they have predicted that humanity would plummet into the depths of collective despair? Could they have predicted that humans would be disempowered, thus losing their connection to spirituality? Did they leave magnificent structures skillfully aligned to the stars and encoded with symbols to act as a trigger for us to wake up now? It seems humanity is at a crucial juncture as we approach 2012. Are we ready to walk forward into a new future? Have we finally cracked the pyramid code? Wake up. We have it. We got it. Just know that we have it. And it works. Yeah.